Matt Mock is our guest here on Hang with Hester. Matt, how much did you pay the announcer to say runs like a running back, not a quarterback? <laughs> well, I, I was doing my best Jacob Hester impression. You know, that's what I, I mean. <laughs> that's what I was trying to do. I was, I was, I was trying to, I was trying to be a better looking Jacob Hester. That's what I was trying to do. That's okay, a a less hair version of Jacob Hester is what you're trying to be. <laughs> I, I did not say that. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I appreciate your time as always. I want to have you on for a number of reasons, but I want to start with the cool article you did on DenverBroncos.com there with their social team. And I didn't even realize this. The Broncos have now had four number 18s in the organization. Yeah. They just drafted Lloyd Cushenberry. Obviously, that's where you were drafted as well. And it is amazing to me how many NFL teams have really picked up on the tradition of the number 18 at LSU. I'm telling you, so, uh, you know, just because I live in Denver, I'm, I'm good friends with a lot of guys that are over there. And uh, and, and Matt Russell is the, basically their uh, pro player development guy. And, and he says it. He goes, man, he goes, listen, he goes, we don't even – he goes, as soon as we – he goes, every team. He goes, as soon as they, they say, oh, he's 18, he goes, they just know that that's a guy they, they would – if they're debating second round, third round, they would draft higher just because they know it's a high character person. So it's just that's kind of a, a cool thing that is, uh, you, you, as you and I have talked, you know, numerous times, something that uh, just evolved. And I think that's why it's such a cool tradition is that it wasn't forced; it just happened. Uh, but the fact that the NFL has so much respect for it is a, is a neat thing. Have you wor- uh, warned Lori Cushenberry how cold it is? Because let me it tell you. Is, it's, it's the secret. That's the secret. So okay. You think it's cold, but it's nice here. It's it nice. is. It is nice. But I remember back in 2013, it was the month of May, and I walked outside, and there was uh, snow up to my shin. I wasn't ready for that. That that is true. That is true. Yeah, you get some crazy stuff, but uh, but the uh, golf courses are open year round, so it's just crazy. Yeah, that's all you care about. Just going to play That's golf. Exa- now it is. Yeah, that is definitely true. <laughs> hey, how yeah. does how does Lloyd fit in there? Uh, was it a Position to need because as you look at it, Lloyd's a guy that can play center and guard. And I know it's a position that they seeked out kind of mm-hmm. in the draft. So does Lloyd have an opportunity to play as a rookie? I actually saw uh, Dalton Reisner, uh, who and I thought Matt. He goes, I I am so pumped up to have him. He goes, you know, I think he's going to be an immediate impact for our team. Um, you know, they've been, Denver has been has been looking for a center. Um, they had Paradis, who, who was a really good player, uh, who moved on. And so they've been looking for some consistency. And I, I think, you know, uh, Lloyd's the perfect fit. Matt Mogg joining us here on Hanging with Hester. Matt, we've, been, we've had a lot of quarterbacks on here recently, but we like to ask um, some of the quarterbacks that watched LSU play this year just what they saw. And you watched Joe Burrow in this LSU offense this season. What did you see? Uh, I mean, I tell people this all the time. I mean, it's his physical ability, he's obviously a great player. Um, but, you know, you're not, Joe's not going to go out and, and, you know, throw go routes and you're going to go, oh, my God, this guy you know, is unbelievable talent. Um, what I was impressed with is how accurate he was, but how well he understood what the coverage was and what the defense was giving you. And he never tried to force it. Uh, he always made the right decision. And, and I think as a, as a quarterback, to do that for a full year, uh, without, I mean, there was not a single game that that he didn't have the same focus. Uh, it was just, I mean, super impressive um, uh, from a from an outside uh, standpoint. Joe said after the season that he felt like being as old as he was playing against younger players was a huge advantage for him. Um, he didn't have yeah. a huge cor- a course load, obviously, either, which is another advantage. But you were an older quarterback at the college level. Did you find that an advantage in your last year? No, to just be honest, when when Jacob saw that, he was pretty happy, right? To talk about how old I am, that was pretty. <laughs> pretty it was in the rundown. Huh? It was definitely in the yeah, rundown. Yeah, exactly. yeah, He said that's got to be included. That has got to be included. Hey, I'm turning uh, 35 tomorrow, yeah. so I had to pick on you a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so exactly. I honestly, I think it is. It's a. Um, I think you just life is all about experience, and when you've experienced something, and you get to go back and and. Uh, and kind of relive it a little bit, uh, you're always going to be better about it. And I think, you know, whether it was me going through minor league baseball or Joe um, not having the success going to that Ohio State, uh, you just you become more focused. And, you know, hey, this is what I want, and this is – I know I'm going to have to do this to attain that. Um, and a credit to him uh, for, for, you know, realizing what he wanted and, and working his butt off to go get it. 
Matt, do you think that now with what Joe was able to do, and I know we've had great quarterbacks in, in LSU history before, but with what he was able to do and the way the offense looked, that it changed the narrative of LSU quarterbacks because we, we've all heard it, right? Since Flynn, LSU was dot in the eye. They were running in between the tackles, all those things. Do you think that Joe yeah. and last season completely changed that forever? Um, I, I do, but, but honestly, I'm going to tell you, I mean, Jacob, you know this, I, I'm not always, I mean, Trey, Trevor Lawrence worked out, Justin Fields is a good player, but those five-star guys aren't always, uh, you know, you win a lot of games, but uh, – but that's not always the guy that wins championships uh, because too many times when you get the five-star guy, they're more worried about them and what those stats are and what they're going to do. Um, when you get a guy like me, Matt Flynn, Joe, uh, who who got a little chip on their shoulder because they didn't, you know, they weren't the, the premier guy. They weren't recruited by everybody. You know, you, you, you realize you kind of take your attitude out of it uh, and you say, hey, I just want to do whatever it takes to win. Um, so I sometimes think Having the guy that's the three star that ends up playing like a five star is better than getting the five star guy. All right, Matt, I've got to ask you about an interview that you did with Jacques Doucet and the story that, that you were telling about you and Michael Clayton sitting on the training table after winning the 2003 national championship. <laughs> and you have tape still on your ankles when Nick comes in and asks you if you're coming back, ask you and Michael the same question. Yeah. That to me is amazing. There was no, hey, congratulations. Thank you for everything that you did. It's like, hey, you coming back? I mean, yeah. the fact that that happened, I mean, I've never really seen anything like that before. What was your feeling when he, when he asked you that question? Uh, I mean, I, at the time, I didn't. it wasn't like I was mad or anything like that. It was just kind of, I, I, I thought he was calling us in for something totally different. <laughs> like, <laughs> like to be like, Hey, uh, we're gonna have an interview in the morning. You guys mind doing being being getting up early and helping out with it, or you know, just something, anything. Um, but when he asked that, I, I kind of walked out, didn't think much about it. But you know, when you reflect back, you just—I think it's why Nick Saban's Nick Saban. You know, I mean, he's just—he's—he's he's relentless, man. Um, he just—he just is always thinking about um, what's the next thing and what I what we need to do as a team to get better. Running an organization, any organization, it doesn't have to be one specific way. I mean, obviously, Saban looks from the outside to be wired a little bit more like Belichick is. They're very focused. Um, they're very demanding. I mean, Pete Carroll's had a ton of success, and they were having parties at USC, and he still cuts up yeah. a little bit out in Seattle. And, and Ogeron has kind of made it to where he wants people to have a really good time when they show up to work. They've done a lot of interviews that have said that. Speak to the culture that Saban creates and, and what it was like operating in it day in and day out. Uh, I, I can tell you this though. I, I know Coach O kind of gets the hey, he's a player's coach because he is. Um, but but I've been out to enough practices of his that he's a player's coach. But but you've got to be you know on your game and focused and ready to go. His practices are are very similar to to Coach Saban's, where they're upbeat, uh, demand a lot, um, and if you don't do what you're supposed to do, uh, you're you're going to hear it. Uh, so I do think he, he's more similar to Saban from uh, when you get out to practice, um, a little bit different maybe off the field. Um, but, yeah, Saban was – he demanded so much, not from just the players, but the coaches. I remember Jimbo telling me – I was in there one day before practice, and he's like – I mean, Jacob does uh, – he was frantic. You know, he's just all over the place. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, and what Saban would do is he would wait until like 30 minutes before practice – and then give Jimbo the the script, and he would have the defense kind of already here. Yeah, this is what we're going to do, and he would make him write down all the plays in 30 minutes before practice, because he wanted him to feel the pressure, just like it is during games. Of of hey, I've got to call this under pressure and get it all done. And I thought that was just kind of an amazing. Like I mean, at the time you're kind of thinking that you know, kind of guess kind of an ass, but uh, but I think it made Jimbo a better play caller. Um, and, and help him uh, in those situations. Um, and I remember talking to those two guys one time, and and, uh, and and Saban and Jimbo both said the same thing. They said, you know, we create this environment in practice that is it's, it's worse than a game uh, to where we're yelling, screaming, demanding so much from you so that when you get out in front of 100,000 people, that you're kind of like, well, this is nothing. Man, you should come to practice. It's terrible. <laughs> 
Hey, one of the things that I that I want to hit on that you mentioned there, you know, Coach O is very intense during practice. Jimbo Fisher was very intense during practice, but they could turn it off. They could turn it yep. off, and after the practice, they could be that father figure. You could go to them with whatever, yeah. and you could have a real conversation. That's one of the things that I never had with Nick. I never had that. Every yep. time that I saw Nick, it, it, it was never going to go out of his way to say hello. It was always head down, almost like I wasn't walking by him. And that was something mm -hmm. that I, I never got used to. I, I, I said that in an interview too, John. I mean, and I think Coach Saban was um, players he was worried about are guys that didn't kind of handle their business. Um, I think he did that a little more with um, guys like me and you, and, and you know the majority of guys on the team that he kind of figured uh, these guys had a kind of had to figure it out a little bit. Um, not that he didn't care. I think he did care. He just he just didn't have. He figured he only had so much time. I got to focus on the guys that might need me more than those guys. Um, and and it was I don't know about hurtful, but you just kind of felt like you're like, damn man. I I do everything I'm supposed to do, and I feel like this guy hates me. Um, so it was just weird. It was hard to get used to. I can say that I can back you up on that. If you did things the right way, you felt like you were doing them the wrong way because you didn't get some extra yeah. attention and not to say that you needed necessarily the extra attention, but it would have been nice just to have a hello or Hey, how you doing today? Because yeah. when you're, when yeah. you're coming, even you, even you who went to the baseball route. So you came in a little bit older, but it's new. It's something you moved across the country and just that affirmation of, of knowing that you can go to your head coach. That was something that I felt like was missing for a long time. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know, if Jake, if you remember this. I always said it was that. Do you remember that that door he had that was on like the uh, magnet, and oh. so like you'd walk into his, and then he he had the the uh, the clicker under his desk. <laughs> he would click it, the door would close behind him. Oh, it was. I remember every time I'm like, oh god, this gonna happen. <laughs> hey, it was the worst. So when I first got to LSU, summer workouts, we're doing the ladder drill, right? And I injured my foot on the ladder drill because it was back when the ladders were metal. They didn't have the nylon ones like they had. Yeah. And so I actually broke a bone in my foot. But it was something – it was only going to keep me out like three or four weeks. But he tried to convince me to gray shirt. And I'm like, Nick, there ain't no way that I'm doing that. But that conversation is the first time that I met the clicker. Shut the yeah. door, clicker. Oh, yeah. I knew it was business. Yeah. And the second yeah. time I was in there for the clicker, he was trying to convince me to move to safety. So I knew if I heard the clicker, and you, I'm sure you had that talk as well, because every offensive player, if he wasn't starting, was he was trying to move to safety at some point. Oh, oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, yeah. yeah you see, well, I, I kind of feel like it just, he thought that we were bad athletes, is what it was. <laughs> they wanted to put us over at this, right? <laughs> oh man, I'm glad you brought that up because if I heard the clicker, I knew it was bad news, and I wasn't in a, a, a good situation <laughs> there. Hey Matt, we went long with you. I apologize for that, but I do appreciate your time, my man. No, anytime, guys. Let's talk to you